Our scripture reading it comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 20. This is going to be the first of two messages uh, in a, a short sub-series in Joshua called The Tale of Two Cities. Uh, next week we'll go over the second part, uh, but this week is the first part. I hope that everybody uh, is able to follow along on page 185 in the Pew Bible, if, if you have access to that. And then at home, if you're using, um, you know, a Bible, it's uh, Joshua chapter 20. I'll give you a, a moment to, to find that passage. As we think about the world that we live in right now, we know that the concept of pollution is everywhere. Uh, politically, we know that there are some people within certain parties uh, who are pushing what we would call a, a Green New Deal to drastically reduce uh, pollution. Uh, some people say that that bill is it's too much. Some people say that it's not enough. But I think by and large, everybody can agree that pollution is a real problem. There is debate regarding what is the most um, toxic pollutant. What is the, the, the biggest source of our pollution? Is it is it carbon? Is it smog and air quality? Is it um, nuclear waste? Is it batteries? Uh, people are, in one sense, trying to reduce our carbon emissions by promoting the use of electric vehicles, which is good. But then there are some people who say, well, those electric vehicles, the batteries in those electric vehicles, are just as toxic, if not more toxic. So what do you do with that? Is it plastic? We see garbage islands floating in the ocean. Is it pesticides? Is it mining, fracking? Is it lead? Is it mercury? What is it? What, what is the worst thing? And I think that we can all agree that all of those things in excess are terrible things. Some of them are unavoidable realities of life. We also know that when nothing is done to curb pollution, we see the effects in the air quality as well as in, in water and the soil. So we know that when there's pollution, if nothing gets done, everybody suffers, especially people who are lower income. They're usually the ones who are the most affected by pollution. In today's scripture reading, we are actually going to be talking about pollution as well, a pollutant in the Bible. Now, I think we can all agree that just about everything that I had mentioned before, plastic, nuclear waste, um, fracking, pesticides, that stuff was not around during the Bible times. Nonetheless, the Bible speaks very clearly about a pollutant that seems to be worse than anything else in the world that when it touches the ground, the ground becomes polluted, it becomes toxic, it becomes um, violated. And that pollutant is blood, human blood. Most specifically, innocent human blood. And as we think about the storyline of the Bible, we don't have to imagine too hard where we have seen in our day and age, or in our history, how innocent blood pollutes things, how innocent blood causes societies and cultures and individuals to cry out. When we think about in America, we think, or in the global history, we think about the Holocaust, we think about various genocides, the Rwandan genocide, the Armenian genocide, the genocide that was going on in the, uh, the Baltic states, or the, the Serbian states, we think about human trafficking. We think about the innocent blood that has been shed in our country. We think about slavery, post-slavery reconstruction with Jim Crow. That's, that statue is at the Equal Justice Initiative Memorial down in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, regarding um, slavery. We think about how during the expansion of civilization out west, we think about how indigenous cultures were wiped out we think about the mass hanging of 38 Sioux individuals in Minnesota in 1862, which is the largest max execution in our country to this day. Recently, we've heard about anti-Asian and Pacific Islander violence, and we know that that is not a new thing in our country, 
whether it was the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s, or there was a riot in LA, the Chinese Massacre in 1871, where 18 Chinese men and young men, boys, were killed and lynched. We hear about this innocent blood that has been crying out. And then that's not even talking about the issue of abortion, where millions of unborn children have never had the opportunity to live. And I know that as I'm listing those things, somebody will say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this example? And yes, absolutely. We have countless examples, even in our own country, where innocent blood cries out for justice. And we see the long-term effects of what happens when nobody stands up for those cases. When innocent people are killed, when their blood is spilled, and nothing happens, we see how just as environmentally the environment is affected, we think about how psychologically that damages people. There is an environmental aspect in our souls when blood is spilt. We think about the studies about the psychological impact that is happening among young black men in America regarding just the, the fact that they could be going out doing everyday things, like going for a jog, like Ahmad Arbery, ah, Ahmad Arbery was doing, and he was killed by white supremacists. And the psychological toll that that takes on a people. Again, we see that the Bible has a lot to say about blood being spilt and its effects. And Joshua chapter 20 has a lot to say about that. Specifically, what do you do when blood is spilt to correct the situation? And what do you do to ensure that no more blood is spilled? How do you stop a situation that can so quickly deteriorate into mob violence or vigilante justice? The Bible says, here's what we have to do in order to make sure that it stops. So in Joshua chapter 20, which we will get to in just a minute, the land has been settled by the nation of Israel. After years and years of fighting and the Canaanites slowly being driven out, everybody is about to go into their own place. And Joshua is explaining to them what life is going to be like in their new land. If you've ever moved before, you, you kind of know what this is like. You, you settle into your house, and there's boxes everywhere, especially if you're kids, and maybe you're living in a house that has um, something that you've never had access to before, like a swimming pool or something like that, or something like a, a, you know, a, a big backyard. Y your parents say, listen, this is great where we're going to be, but because we are in this new place, a place where maybe we, we don't know what it's like, we have to go over some ground rules about what life is going to be like. In order, to, in order for us to truly enjoy this house, we need to know what is the best way to live here. And again, may, maybe you know that feeling where you're surrounded by all these new things and your parent or a teacher says, hold on, we have to go over some very important rules first. And so Joshua is tasked with explaining to his people God has given you this land as an inheritance. And even though this land is a, a symbol about how God lives among his people, like when, when you are here, God lives with you here. Life is still not how it's supposed to be. Even though God is here, accidents will still happen. And a lot of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, laws, kind of, dealing with the, what we would call case laws. Like, when this happens, here is how you are supposed to respond. Some laws are like, you know, you should always do this. You should always honor your mother and father. You should always do this. And then there are some laws that are set up that say, life is not the way that it is supposed to be. And so when something bad happens, here is what you are supposed to do. And in Joshua chapter 20, this whole chapter is a case law about what happens when the actions of one person accidentally lead to the death of somebody else. What we would call today maybe inadvertent manslaughter, where the accident or where the, the actions of one person accidentally lead to the death of somebody else. 
Because the Bible knows very well that this world is not the way that it's supposed to be. And so even though you are in a good place, accidents will happen. And sometimes because of those accidents, somebody will die. Early in the passage, or in the scriptures, we have already seen this concept of murder, where somebody intentionally takes the life of somebody else. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God, after he um, has the water receives, receive, he gives this command to, to, uh, to uh, Noah in Genesis chapter 9. He says that if anyone commits murder, that person's life is forfeit. Because an image bearer, somebody who bears the image of God, has lost their life. And Genesis 9 says that if, and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning from the life of man. And then in poetic form, it says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man, so his blood shall be shed. For God has made man in his image. So we see the very important reason why. Because man is made in the image of God, their life is extremely valuable. It does not say that about animals. It does not say that animals are created in God's image. It only says that about humanity, both male and female. And then later on in Exodus chapter 20, when we know about the Ten Commandments, that really famous one where it says, you shall not commit murder, we see the utmost seriousness that the Bible puts on life because all of humanity is made in the image of God. And so oftentimes, especially in, in civilizations, Western civilizations that um, get a lot of their laws from the Bible, they will use this concept of when you take the life of somebody else, your life is forfeited. You lose the right to your life. There has to be an equal transaction of life for life. And we know that in America, the concept of capital punishment is a, a hotly debated issue. Some people, as I was referencing that passage, like, oh, he's going to talk about capital punishment. And some people may not have been aware of that. And I'm just going to say, regarding capital punishment, the concept of the state having the right to take the life of somebody who has been tried and found guilty of murder or extenuating circumstances, Christians can debate about the validity of capital punishment. We also know that in our country, capital punishment has been disproportionately implemented against people of color and other people living in low-income areas who may not have equal access to quality legal protection, many of whom who, after they have been put to death, their cases get re-examined and they find out that they were innocent. There are arguments on both sides regarding the issue of capital punishment, its effectiveness in deterring crime, as well as the debate of, does it actually help the family of the person who was killed? Does it help them grieve or does it help them move on knowing that their, their, their perpetrator was put to death? Some say yes, some say no. And so with all of these questions regarding, you know, how do we fairly use capital punishment when our, our country has such a terrible history of using it towards one group of people and not this other group of people, what doesn't change, whether you are in favor of it or not, is the fact that when innocent life is lost, when, a, when there is a death of an image bearer of God, is it, a, it is a tragedy. And something needs to happen because of that. Now, we've just talked about murder, but what about accidental cases? And this is where Joshua chapter 20 picks up. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people in Israel, Appoint cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly kills him may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge 
from the avenger of blood. He shall flee to one of those cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders there. Then they shall take him to the city, give him a place, and there he shall remain. If the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in the city that he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is the high priest at that time. Then the manslayer shall return to his own town, his own home, to the town of which he has fled. And so they set apart Kadesh and Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali and Shechem in the, hitty, in the hill city of Ephraim, Kiriath Arba, that is in Hebron, and the hill country of Judah. And beyond the Jordan, east of, the Jer- of Jericho, they appointed Beziar in the wilderness on the tableland, and from the t- tribe of Rum, uh, Reuben and Ramoth in Gilead, from the tribe of Gad in Golan and Bashan, from the tribe of Manasseh. These are the cities designated for all the people of Israel who and for the stranger sojourning among them that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there so that they might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. So like a lot of the laws in Joshua, he is repeating something that has been given previously in the book of Numbers. Specifically, this is Numbers chapter 35. The summary is basically that if if anyone accidentally kills somebody, and they kind of give some examples about how somebody is working, they're swinging an axe, and somebody walks behind them, and the axe hits that person accidentally in the head, the person didn't know they were behind them, or something else happened, there was an accident at work, and somebody died, and the person who was sort of responsible for that, they could flee to this city. Now, there are some cases where if somebody did it on purpose, they are considered a murderer, and there is this person called an avenger of blood, a family relative that is kind of responsible for bringing that person to justice. But in accidental cases, there's this weird in-between where it's like, this wasn't on purpose, What do we do? But we know that oftentimes in accidental cases, there is still this self-appointed avenger of blood from that person's family who feels like they have to find this person and hold them accountable, even though it was an accident. So in cases like that, the innocent person flees to the city of refuge. The city of refuge has to accept them. They have to protect them from the person who is pursuing them to try and you know, maybe attack them or maybe enact some vigilante justice of their own. In the city of refuge, this person who came there, they can't leave. They can't stay there for a couple days and then leave. They have to stay there until they get their trial. And then when it is determined that it was an inadvertent accident, they still have to stay there until the death of the high priest. There are some other laws that say that you cannot, ex- you cannot accept a ransom for them. So if the avenger of blood comes and says, I will give you $10,000 if, if you hand that person over to me, it says you cannot accept that. Now at the end, they gave all of those cities, and without actually being able to visualize where those cities are, that may not ne- mean too much, but it's actually a really cool thing that when you see those cities on a map, and we have a slide of that, you can actually see that there are three cities on the west side of the Jordan River, three cities on the east side of the Jordan River, and the north, and the central, and the south. It's the Bible's, it's God's way of saying, listen, these cities are of refuge need to be really easy to access. I think if, um, I read in one commentary that said that the way that it's set up, these cities of refuge, the farthest one away was a one-day journey. Could you imagine what it would be like if you were in that situation where you inadvertently killed somebody and the nearest city of refuge was totally out of, out of area? You couldn't get there? And so God says, look, in the case of the need of a city of refuge, 
it has to be easy to get there because we know we are introduced to this character, an avenger of blood. We think about the Avengers movie. Here is this avenger of blood. And it seems like he's chasing after him, trying to get what what they would understand of justice. Because in their mind, this person lost their life, so therefore, the person who did it has to lose their life. And the Bible says, listen, we have to slow down. We have to ensure that there is what we call in our, our legal system, due process. To make sure that the person has the full amount of protection that is available to them. You know, we, we love stories and movies of justice, don't we? we? We are so fascinated by movies where something happens to somebody, like their family gets killed, or, or their wife gets killed, or, or their child gets killed, or, or even a pet of theirs gets killed, and then they go on this, this self-appointed um, justice mission where they go and they track down everybody who was part of that gang, everybody who was part of that mob, and, and they exact their revenge on them. We, we love movies like that because there's this innate sense where we want there to be justice. And so that's what the Avenger of blood is doing. And again, as, as we think about this issue of capital punishment, as well as this idea of what would some people call the eye for the eye. There are some questions that get brought up about that thing. We think about that quote from Gandhi, which says, an eye for an eye only makes the whole world blind. And so sometimes people hear these retributions, and they think, so all this does is you know, perpetuate the cycle of violence. But in reality, this concept of God expecting life to be submitted when life is lost, or an eye for an eye, we know that these rules are only in place because this world is not the way that it's supposed to be. Sin and death have been around since Genesis chapter 3, and we've seen the way that it has just wreaked havoc on the world. And so God puts these laws in place, this eye for an eye, not to perpetuate the cycle of violence, but in reality to actually stop it in its place, to make sure that only proportionate punishment gets distributed and not more. It keeps things from escalating. It keeps things from descending into tribal blood feuds that go on for generations. We hear about these blood feuds that have been going on in cultures around the world, as well as gang violence, how it's just this continual cycle. Well, if this happened, then we need to up the ante to show that we are the ones who are the most offended. But God's law actually stops the cycle of violence. And even those movies where the the hero goes and he gets his revenge, we don't often think about the collateral damage that gets caused by this person's revenge. We think about stories and and sometimes movies where it's like, they killed my wife, so I'm going to go kill his wife in front of him and his children, and then I'm going to kill him. There's a movie from the late 80s called The Untouchables about Elliot Ness trying to find and stop Al Capone during the era of Prohibition, and Sean Connery, who was one of the Untouchables, the crime enforcement people, he was, he was encouraging Elliot Ness to basically use extreme retribution, saying something like, they, if they put one of your guys in the hospital, then you put one of their guys in the morgue. So this whole idea of an eye for an eye is saying, only what has happened will be enacted as a punishment. Only. Because we know that when these cycles of violence, these tribal blood feuds happen, more and more blood, innocent blood, pollutes the land. We think about how the Chernobyl accident in 1986 where the nuclear reactor broke and all that nuclear waste, nuclear radiation went up into the atmosphere and into the ground about how you couldn't live there. Slowly people are coming back to it, but you couldn't live there because it was so unsafe. And here the same idea is, 
God is saying that when, listen, when blood gets spilt, it pollutes the land. When innocent, when, when innocent blood gets spilt, it's even worse. Numbers 35 says, you shall not pollute the land in which you live. For blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land. No atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except for the blood by the one who has shed it. And so again, he's saying, look, in the case of a murder, there has to be blood to cover the blood. The guilty blood has to cover the blood of the innocent blood. But in cases of accidental murder, if, if, if there's more blood shed, it just makes it worse. And then he goes on to say, for you defile the land that you live in, in the midst of which I live in, for the Lord, for I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. God is saying all of these things. It's like, you have to take life seriously. You have to value it. And even sometimes that means holding somebody accountable for the life that they take because I am with you. That's why God gives all of his laws to his people. Because you are my people and I am with you. The way that you treat one another is because I am with you. The way that you love one another, it's because I am with you. The way that you care for one another, you care for the sojourner, you care for the, the widow, for the orphan. The, the reason why you are fair with one another is because I am with you. I am in your midst. And when everything goes haywire, and when people don't take life seriously, it pollutes the land. And we've seen what, what's happened in Scripture in other places where the land is polluted. In Genesis chapter 4, the first murder that takes place where Cain kills his brother Abel out of jealousy. And God confronts Cain and says, Cain, where is your brother? And, and Cain cr tries to deflect the question. But ultimately God says, look, the blood of your brother is crying out from the ground. And because of that, God actually exiles Cain from his land. He has to leave. God still enacts a protection to make sure that, that Cain isn't murdered by somebody else because God still keeps his promise to his people. He says, I'm going to protect you. Even in this case where your life should be forfeit, God says, I am going to show you mercy. But he was exiled nonetheless. And then in Exodus, where God is leading his people, he's saying, I'm delivering you into this land where the Canaanites are right now. But the Canaanites' wicked practice has polluted the land. And so they are going to be exiled from it. They are going to be destroyed. And even in the cases in Exodus and Leviticus, there are elaborate rituals during the Day of Atonement where the priest himself has to purify the temple because the temple has been defiled. The temple has been made impure by all the blood that has been shed to cover the sins of the people. It's this weird cycle where the blood of the sacrifices purifies a person, but it also makes the temple impure. And so therefore, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest has to take the blood of an animal to purify the temple. The blood of a substitute has to be shed in order for something to be made clean. So again, we see this idea that there has to be blood to atone for, in this case, a murderer, but also in the case of something being defiled. And so that's what the Avenger is trying to do. He's trying to clean or purge innocent blood that has been shed. And it's not just in the temple, but it's the whole earth. Because I think what happens sometimes is that we think that when, when it comes to the temple, that's where God's presence is. And yes, that's where God's presence is, is centralized and localized. But don't you see that the Bible paints this whole picture that all of the earth is God's temple. That God is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. That there's no sort of sacred, there's no divide where God doesn't care what happens here. He only cares about here. I think sometimes what happens is that people think, if I just do my sort of spiritual duty on Sunday, then I can do whatever I want during the rest of the week. 
But in reality, God says, no, every aspect of this world is mine. And so we see that God takes life very seriously because we are made in God's image. And that when something happens, when life is lost, there has to be an atonement. As well as if life is to be protected, it has to be protected by due process, by protecting the innocent party. And so lastly, we look at this, uh, this idea of the city of refuge, and we ask ourselves, who has access to it? Well, the scriptures make it very clear. Everybody has access to it. The Israelite as well as the foreigner. All throughout scripture, God makes it very, very clear that there are not two categories of people. People who get protected by the law, and then foreigners who, they don't really belong there, so who cares what happens to them? God says... Israel and the foreigners, the sojourners, are all protected as my people. And we think about our country's history, how quickly we can treat people differently or not get quite as upset when their rights get taken away because they look different than us. Or maybe we think that they don't belong, so we don't care necessarily what happens to them. We think about our country's history, how quickly, especially if we think about it in terms of post-Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow in the South, how quickly black men and women would lose their lives because a white person slandered them. A white person says something, and a mob comes after that person, and their life is lost. It doesn't take more than an accusation, and the vulnerable person who has no access to legal protection, their life is lost. We think about how if society sees somebody as inconvenient, how disposable they become. And even if we think about it in terms of the abortion debate, how it's always being promoted as people who um, you know, want to keep abortion legal, that they want to keep it safe, they want to keep it legal, and they want to keep it rare. And yet we also know that there are some people within those camps who are seeking to remove any restrictions at all. That it doesn't matter the rhyme, it doesn't matter the reason, that if, if the mother or the family decides that they want an abortion, then they should be able to have it, and the taxpayer should have to pay for it. Because fundamentally, there is this view that that baby is inconvenient. Now, please, first of all, understand something. Don't at me at Twitter, because I'm not on Twitter. It's not going to make any difference. I know that there are people who have been affected by abortion who have undergone that process, not because they saw the child as inconvenient, not because you know, they're cold-hearted monsters, but because they were scared, and they were in a very uh, scary situation in life, and, and at that time they felt that that was the best position. As well as we know that over the past several years, the abortion rate in America has actually gone down, regardless of who is in the White House, regardless who is sitting in the Supreme Court, And again, there there are so many layers to the abortion debate, but at at the end of the day, both that issue as well as racism comes down to the issue of do do we value life or do we see people as mere obstacles to getting what we want? And again, I, I, I want to fully express that the church should be a place for people who have gone through the tragedy of abortion to, to feel like this is a place where they can be welcomed and they can find refuge here. And we know that that is not often the case. But we see in scripture that God has a very special place in his heart for people who the rest of society might see as inconvenient. God says, no, 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 no. You need to very, very specifically and intentionally protect those people. That's why he put the cities where they were, so everybody could get access to them. Now, finally, as we come to kind of the the last part of this passage, we need to see a reality. That even though this person was innocent and, you know, they they were protected under the the process, the due process, it it was deemed an accident. That person's life is never the same. 
They are innocent, but they are still exiled. Did you see how they have to stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest? It doesn't really say why it's the high priest, but again, here's this idea that in the case of a murder, the perpetrator's blood sort of covers the blood of the innocent person. He loses his life as that person lost their life. But here in this case, it's the high priest who sort of has to lose their life in order for this person to go home. Again, it doesn't explicitly say why, but we know that this person's life is drastically altered, and we know. Maybe there are people in our family or friends or maybe even somebody here in this room. We know what that is like to where maybe we have been involved in an accident that resulted in the death of somebody else. Or we think about people who are uh, authorized by the state to have the power to take somebody's life. And in in the full just uh, expression of that, if, if it is a just use of force, we know that that person's life is never the same. Their life is fundamentally altered. And here again, we see that even in cases of accidents, that person's life is fundamentally altered. They have to be exiled. And we think about the impact that that might have on their family, on the business, on their, on their children. We think about the families and children of incarcerated people, how, how they grow up missing that family member. And it's the same case here. And then sometimes even we ask, ask ourselves the question, well, what does the burden of forgiveness look like for the family of somebody who lost their life? What does it look like to know, yes, that it was an accident, but I'm still harboring these feelings of bitterness. What do I do with that? See, all of these questions, again, show this, this, this mystery that even in accidents, when life is lost, it is so serious that nothing is the same. They were innocent, but they are still exiled. And the families are still missing somebody at the dinner table. Because we are made in the image of God. So what do we do with a passage like this? I must admit that this is the part where it's kind of like, okay, now what? Because even though in, this, in, our, in our country's history we base a lot of our rules, a lot of our laws around this idea of being made in God's image, we are created by God with certain inalienable rights, we don't have cities of refuge for people to flee to. Because we know that in the Old Testament law, there are certain laws that we cannot reproduce as a country. So what do we do? Well, first of all, I would say let's, on an individual level, see the horizontal application of this question of the value of life. Do we value life as the Bible calls us to? Or do we give our political tribes, our political parties, free passes when it comes to issue of devaluing life? Whether it's the issue, you know, kind of the the obvious answer or the obvious issue of abortion, do we kind of just say, yeah, well, well, or do we hold our party accountable and say, no, no, this is not okay and we need to challenge and push back? Or on issues of capital punishment, do we sort of say, hey, whatever, whatever happens, happens? Or do we say, no, no, capital punishment has been grossly misapplied in our country and we really need to figure out Is this worth keeping? How do we justly and fairly use this so it's not just mostly one type of people who are put to death under capital punishment? Again, we have to ask ourselves, do we give our political parties a free pass and not hold them accountable because, hey, at least I'm not the other guy? Do we find people who disagree with us on issues of policy regarding life If they disagree with us, do we find them so unbelievably stupid that we think that they're beyond us extending dignity towards them? Do we think that if if you disagree with me on this issue, then I must become the, the proverbial avenger of blood, and I have to track you down to exact ideological revenge? 
Or do we remember that as we consider these issues, the words of Micah 6, 8, where it says, God wants his people to pursue justice, but to do it while they love mercy and they walk humbly with, our, with their God. And I think that for the most part, the answer to these questions is no, we don't do that. I know I don't do that. I know I tend to see people who disagree with me as, <laughs> how could they see that this way? And so it calls for humility, that we would, again, see the value that the Bible puts on life as us being image bearers and say, we have to protect that. We have to protect that. And I know some people might hear this and say, well, okay, yeah, that's all well and good, but I've never killed anybody. But we know that when Jesus comes and he's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, the very sort of teaching on the law that we've been studying, rather than making it easier for us to say, oh, you didn't actually kill anybody? Then yeah, this has nothing to do with you. You can go and do something else. Or, or you support the right political party, quote unquote, the right one? Then that's okay. Then you can do whatever you want. Rather, Jesus magnifies the law. He actually makes it harder for us to, to get away with sort of giving ourselves a free pass. Because Jesus says that, he says, I, listen, you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder. But I tell you the truth that if you are like angry with your brother, if you hate your brother, if you mock your brother or, or your sister, then you are guilty of murder. You're not guilty of accidental killing. You are guilty of murder. What Jesus is doing here is he's showing us that ultimately that when we sin, as the Bible says in Psalm 51, all of our sins are ultimately against God. Because when we sin against an image bearer, we are sinning against the very one that it's bearing image of. Jesus points our real problem that all of our sins are ultimately against God. That when we devalue life, we are devaluing God's greatest gift. And so he paints a real serious problem that we have. But we are also reminded that the one who we sin against, and the one who is our judge, is also our only hope. Because as Joshua has been telling us about a city of refuge where guilty people can go, in cases of or if we want to call it innocent people can go in case of accidents, the scripture continually points that God is our refuge. He is the one who invites guilty people to run to him. Because we know that when we look at our sins, these aren't accidents that we're committing. This is intentional time and time again, choosing to value something over God. God still says, listen, come to me to find healing. Come to me to find restoration. Come to me to find peace and forgiveness. And when we do that, when we run to God, he makes us new. He restores our relationship with him as well as with each other. You see, nowadays it's so easy to sort of see people as other than us, with that extreme sort of tribalism where we see people who disagree with us, Democrats and Republicans, uh, liberals and conservatives, progressives and the middle people of the road, middle of the road, that, that we can't agree with one another, and the only way that we could actually get somebody to change their mind is to shame them into submission until they see the errors of their ways. But then when we do that, we're still left with this profound sense of loss in the case of when somebody loses their life. We may sort of have, you know, owned the libs or owned the, own the, the conservatives on this issue, but at the end of the day, especially in case of loss of life, that person is still gone. I'm going to quote at length an opinion piece that's from the New York Times from an author, Elizabeth Brunig, in regards to responding to uh, the case where Officer Chauvin was held accountable for the death of George Floyd. Because I know a lot of people have seen the quote from Bernie Sanders that said that Chauvin was held accountable, but George Floyd did not receive justice. He was account Chauvin was accountable, but at the end of the day, George Floyd is dead. So what do we do with that suffering and loss? The author says, in one sense, nothing. Pain lasts, grief lasts, anger lasts. The life that you had before, loss is never returned to you. There's a hole in the world, one of many regrettable results of our human tendency to hurt one another. Forgiveness 
doesn't feel particularly triumphant. It's a gift that nobody wants to be in the position to give. It re releases a wrongdoer from a moral debt for their own good and for the common good, not for the sake of the wronged. And it provides a place for those emotions that circle vulture-like around one's thoughts to finally come to rest, no longer nourished by attention. It's a strange and wanting gift for a strange and wanting world. And I would never admonish anyone for declining it to extend it. God knows I have failed in the practice as often as I have succeeded. And they go on to say, but I want to live in a world where it is possible to forgive and to be forgiven. In fact, I think it's necessary. And I think it emerges not from a place of moral victory, but from the realization of human brokenness. The recognition of things lost can't be regained, and from the emptiness that holds its place. It's from these gaps that beautiful things can sometimes grow. And as we close this sermon today, I just want to encourage one another, as we think about how this applies to communion, that the author of this piece wrote it because they want to live in a world of forgiveness. They want to live in a world for, of forgiveness. And that's the hope that the gospel offers to people. Not from the sense of, as the author said, well, we're all broken, we can just show each other the same kindness. But because in the gospel, we have seen what it truly means to be forgiven because of Jesus. We've seen how in Joshua chapter 20, about how the blood of the guilty person has to be shed in order for the innocent person's life to be sort of atoned for, to remove the pollution from the ground. But in the gospel, we see the reversal about how the innocent blood of our great high priest Jesus is shed so that our sins could be forgiven. Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2 said that there was no deceit found in Jesus. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. 2 Corinthians says that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might be able to be called the righteousness of God. Hebrews goes on to explain that Jesus is our merciful great high priest. He is the one who is able to save from the outermost anyone who would trust in him. He is our great high priest whose own blood covers our sin. He is the great high priest who was exiled so that we could be brought in. We see in Joshua chapter 20 about how the death of the high priest had to occur in order for the exiled innocent person to be able to return to God's people. In Jesus, as we will celebrate in communion in just a moment, we see that Jesus, the innocent high priest, gave up his life through that through his blood, we, the guilty people, might be able to be made clean. Our sins could be forgiven once and for all, and that we could be brought into God's presence through the blood of Jesus. An offer that is made to anybody. There are no outsiders to God's love.